Is it morning? Some of you probably it's still night time. Yeah. Well done. Great night last night. Amazing award winners. Were truly amazing. And the um, I think they got the thing that got to me was you know to use Lewis Peachy's word, this family. Um, it just feels like family. It's it was just fantastic. And congratulations to I mean there's a lot of people here who spent a lot of time both in RDAA and Akram, making it feel like family. And I think you know, it's succeeding and has succeeded for some years now. So uh, congratulations to you all. And I think you should just all congratulate yourselves. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of this land, the Ngunnawal people, um, and the contribution they make to the continuing culture of this, uh, of this region. Um, I'd like to pay my respects to um, past elders, present elders, and future elders and acknowledge that this land has never been ceded and never will be. Um, just a few reflections as we come into the last day. Um, I think that it was clear, certainly from the feedback that we got after yesterday, that a clear implementation plan for the rural general, generalist pathway is something that everybody wants to see with clear targets, understanding roles and responsibilities. Um, I think that um, a lot of hard think this is me talking now, thinking has to go into this, the National Rural Health Commissioner's position. Um, it's not the person who's in it, the position itself is flawed and does not have enough power. And um, how do you actually get a position within government that has power? Um, and I think that not if but when the voice is approved um, through referendum um, a, you know, a, a cooperative arrangement with whatever structure is there for the voice for rural health is going to be really important as well. And maybe a concept like a National health, Rural Health Commission with state-based equivalents with power and money might make a difference. But I think it's quite clear uh, with two really good people in the position of Rural Health Commissioner, um, one after the other, and really not having the power to effect change it means there's something wrong with the position, and that maybe is a, uh, an advocacy role. That's me talking, not any other organization. Um, you also, um, while you lunched yesterday, learned about the Australian STI management guidelines for use in primary care. Really important. Um, the has not gone away as an issue. Um, can I just say that the, um, not enough of you have gone to see the Akram 25-year history uh, timeline. I mean, this is an important anniversary this year. It's in the foyer. And there's an opportunity to take a Polaroid sh shot and have you integrated into the, the next 25 year history. So please go and have a look at that and, uh, and, and engage with it. Um, also yesterday, the ACRAM and RDAA teams gave you some ideas and hot tips on how the media works, how to prepare for a media interview and undertaking an interview. I should have gone to that. Yeah, I, I need that sort of thing. Um, we celebrated the annual Akram and RDWA Awards last night, a spectacular event. Um, it's not too late to continue to get involved in the RMA 22 gamification, some incredible prizes up for grabs, such as RMA 23 registration, social function tickets, and an ultimate heart sport prize. The draw for the top prizes will be announced this afternoon. And now I'd like to uh, invite Liam Spence to give a vote of thanks for the sponsored future Rural Generalist Program. Good morning, and congratulations on making it after last night. Um, I would like to start by acknowledging the Ngunnawal people of this land upon which we meet today, uh, and pay my respects to elders past, present, and emerging, and uh, extend my respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people that might be with us here today. Uh, my name's Liam Spence. I'm a first year medical student with the University of Wollongong at the Wollongong campus. And I'm privileged to be here uh, for the first face-to-face -face RMA conference in a number of years, and of course for Akram's 25th anniversary as well. Um, and as a sponsored future rural generalist. Each year the RMA offers sponsored positions to several students uh, that cover the cost of attendance of this event and includes access to several social events and networking events, including that magnificent dinner last night. 
I'm here today to thank the sponsors that uh, have made it possible for students such as myself, um, but others here as well, to attend this incredible conference and this amazing event um, as future RGs. This year, the incredible generosity of 82 sponsors has allowed 80% of this year's applicants for sponsorship to be able to come here on that sponsorship, which is quite extraordinary. On behalf of all of us who have received a position this year, um, I would like to extend my deepest thanks and our deepest thanks for this incredible opportunity. Beyond bridging the, the obvious financial barrier that all medical students obviously face in making decisions to come to events like this, this sponsorship carries, I think, a deeper meaning for all of us. I've been speaking with other sponsored future RGs throughout the last few days to try and get a feel for what it means for, for them to be here. And what I've heard, I think, should make any organisation or professional group very, very proud. We've been made to feel like welcomed and supported colleagues from day one, and we have all received that sense of deep welcome, um, and we can sense that you're invested in our futures um, and in helping us achieve our goals in rural health, however bold they may be. Being here and being surrounded by such incredible people, such as those we saw last night receiving awards, is truly inspiring. I think all in this room should feel proud of the professional, collegiate, and welcoming culture that has so easily made us as students feel affirmed in choosing rural health as our professional home. Speaking for myself and for the other sponsored RGs here this year, our attendance and your welcoming spirit makes it very, very easy for us to make the choice to commit to a career in rural medicine in the future and to one day be hopefully working as your colleagues. So to each of the sponsors that have allowed us to be here, but also to each of you, all you delegates, um, that have so kindly welcomed us this year into the conference and shared your time, your knowledge, your experience, and your support with us, um, our deepest thanks. Dan Halliday is a senior medical officer, rural generalist based at Stanthorpe. He has a special interest in obstetrics. Dan considers he's been fortunate to be surrounded by passionate rural general practitioners and advocates in a range of forums. He's fully appreciative of the role that the family plays in the support of colleagues practicing medicine. We heard a lot about that last night and readily acknowledges the support of his wife, Kathy, and their children, Grace, William, and Georgia. Please welcome the current member, or the current president of ACRAM for his presidential address, Dan Halliday. We'll get there. Oh, yeah. So, thank you, Norman. Um, and thank you all for your attendance uh, and welcome today. Um, I'd like to first start by acknowledging the traditional custodians and the land on which we meet, uh, the Ngunnawal people. I pay my respects to the elders past and present. Uh, and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here today. I think you all agree that the Rural, Medicine, Red Rural Medical Conference has been food for the soul. Uh, we have been able to connect and reconnect. And I've been part of a number of reflective discussions uh, in the recent past to note that while there's some trepidation about our future may hold, that there is an underlying sense of optimism and hope. And that's one of the great things I love about ACRAM. Um, its ability to take what is thrown at it and to do the job that has to be done. The willingness to do the hard yards uh, has seemingly been with me since my involvement um, in the rural and remote medicine uh, sphere, and, and that started some 20 years ago. Being my first formal duty as incoming uh, ACRAM president, I note with no small appreciation that my address is time to co coincide with the beyond-themed component of this year's conference theme, Bold, Boundless, Beyond, Together. Before, however, I take the step from the here and now and into the unknown that would be my next two years as Akron president, I would like to thank my colleague, Dr. Sarah Chalmers, for her tireless dedication to the role over the past two years. Has, <laughs> it 
hasn't been the easiest terms uh, for Sarah, and continuing the legacy generated by Dr Ewan McPhee um, in the early days of the COVID response and transi transitioning into a new college-led training landscape. However, Sarah has tackled the issues as they developed in a collegiate and consultative manner, being a consummate professional. I'd like you all, and, and, and certainly I think that we would find that that thanks and appreciation would extend to Akron board directors and college council members who have given their time and commitment since our last face-to-face -face gathering in 2019. Of particular note, I'd like to acknowledge the significant roles played by departing board director Dr Mike Beckoff and college council chair Eve Murfield. Mike has been a valued member of the Akron board since the introduction of the new college constitution and before um, and the organisational restructure in 2014. Mike has led many developments and overseen the progress of the college by actively engaging on many committees, most recently as chair of the Finance and Risk Management Committee. And his expert and ex expertise and experience has been greatly appreciated and will be dearly missed. Thank you, Mike. <laughs> Eve has been a dedicated contributor to the functioning of the college following on from my stepping down as college council chair in 2017. I've greatly appreciated Eve's calming and considered influence in our council meetings. I'm also grateful to Eve on a personal note for hosting my family and I for a short stay in Southport and Dover as the country opened up briefly from COVID in December 2020. It was a shared moment in time that was sorely needed. Southern Tasmania is a magical place and I would encourage any of you to take a visit down that way should you have the chance. Taking over the College Council's role by my colleague Dr Brendan Carrigan and I look forward to working with Brendan to ensure Akram maintains the high standards it's set and works to meet the challenges of the future ahead. I recently reached out to Brendan to provide me with a summary of his thoughts as we move into the next two years. Appreciating a very comprehensive response, I'd like to point out one comment in particular. Ultimately, we need to flip the system. Acknowledge that most care occurs in the community and this is of high value. Privilege this, examine the system from this frame first ask why there is no paid GP in the room. And noticing that obviously, you know, we are especially college general practitioners and we will soon be um, acknowledged, you know, as rural generalists in our own right under specialty general practice, I couldn't agree more. With the calibre of colleagues like Brendan in the room, I'm confident with such a diverse and skilled board and council, Akram is well placed in an ever-changing and challenging medical landscape. I'd like to think that I have my own moments of being bold and taking advantage um, of the boundless opportunities that rural medicine offers. We are a community of many parts. However, with shared interests, there are opportunities to move forward, beyond and together. From my perspective, though, this will require a degree of humility and mutual respect. In my view, we'll need to start as well with some reflections on where we've come from acknowledging our very, very strong roots, why we are here, and establishing a thought process, developing our shared visions of the future. The fight to gain respect and recognition while rising to the challenge has been seemingly something that I've been involved in for most of my career, um, and has been reflected in the various roles that have led me to this point in time. My identity is shaped by being not only a rural generalist and clinical manager, I'm a husband, father, son, brother, friend. I'm a farmer, a collaborative winemaker, and a closet cricket tragic. I have had numerous roles in industrial advocacy and training. These go to make me who I am. I bring these elements to the role of Akron president. And please know, like all roles I've undertaken, I, perform to, I aim to perform to the role and to the best of my ability. In declaring what I would like to see of my rural medicine colleagues in the future, echoing the sentiment of one of our dear colleagues, Dr Colin Owen, rural communities need to have confident and competent doctors that are comfortable and content. How do we achieve this? I'd like to think back to also what gave me confidence to my progression as a pre-Vanguard rural generalist in Queensland some years ago into the specialist training field of general practice, looking at rural journalism and how the concept of rural journalism developed at that time. The following elements or pillars 
have been identified in Queensland, but I, I still feel that they actually ring true to actually underpinning our, our, our foundations of the future of rural generals practice. We look at the value of practice, the value of profession. We are getting there. We are getting that specialist recognition. We are getting that the remuneration isn't quite there. There is some differences and, and vagaries between uh, the, the role of public and private practice uh, and the seemingly uh, disconnect between that is going to be an ongoing challenge. We have a defined pathway. ACRAM has a process in place to actually manage that and actually support that and promote that. But there are elements of our, our training uh, continuum which doesn't necessarily actually reflect into that and fit into that properly. And I think that's going to be another challenge for us to, to make sure that, that we are all work together, which obviously is you know, one of the key things associated with this conference, working together to make sure that that process is made very clear and, and straightforward uh, for our, our, our trainees, our registrars coming forward, and also our supervisors uh, and other colleagues to be aware of. There is no change in the importance of these four pillars today. Through the transition to college-led training, Implementation of CPD homes and contributing to the process of strengthening Medicare is ACRAM is right in the mix of reform. ACRAM acknowledges and promotes your rights as specialists in the field of general practice and soon to be further acknowledged with the recognition, finally, of rural generalist practice in its own right as a specialty in the field of general practice. And I acknowledge the intent and wishes of some of our colleagues to actually move that further. We must support the concepts of easy entry, gracious exit into our communities and engage communities wherever possible. I have found that they are willing to listen and support rural medicine. We just need to open up and engage. We need to find those exemplars that we can share with our communities to actually en enable them and empower them to engage in the concept of rural medicine and support their own health. I would like to acknowledge that all we've been able to achieve going forward and what we have the opportunities to achieve into the future will not be possible, possible without support of my family and of course the support of families of all of us in the room. Noting that my children, who are at times an absent father and my ever enduring wife, Cathy, an absent husband, have been pillars, my pillars of support and I'd like to thank them for their time as I go into the next two years. I can. I continue to commit to my community and as I take on this role. However, they too might not see me as much over the next couple of years. And I'd like to acknowledge the support given to me at home by my team at Stanthorpe Hospital and the support shown to me as I've worked into the President's role. My intent going forward is to widen my community commitment to you, my rural community, my, my family, my Akram family, and on a wider note to our rural community as a whole. As ACRAM strives to provide the right doctors in the right places, providing rural and remote people with excellent health care. Going forward, I'd like to see ACRAM maintain its strong relationships with members and be able to welcome many more who will find a home for themselves, their interests, and develop them within the ACRAM family. The ACRAM values of being visionary and courageous while being experts in a field and inclusive of being an open and welcoming group of diverse individuals united by a common purpose stand firm and strong. So in conclusion, thank you again to the Akron community for your confidence in me, and please know that I appreciate your support as we move forward to the challenges awaiting us. Thank you, Dan. It shows you the depth of the bench when um, you get the handover, and uh, it's uh, of uh, equal quality. Um, this conference has been benefited hugely from the student volunteers and here to propose a vote of thanks, thanks to them is Zoe Wright. Good morning, everyone. Um, so I thought I'd tell you a bit about the student volunteer positions before we go on to thank them. 
Um, so these are bursary positions that the students apply for and are selected for and are becoming increasingly competitive. So congratulations to the students that were successful. I think there's a few in the room today. They have been identifiable throughout the conference in a very attractive bright pink vest. Um, so in terms of what they provided the team um, throughout RMA. I've been told by Rachel, our event manager, that they couldn't have done it without student volunteers. So a vote of thanks to all of them and we hope this has been a good opportunity for you to engage with some hopefully future peers in rural and remote medicine. And I remember um, back to my student days not too long ago but um, it was coming to conferences like this and meeting truly inspirational uh, mentors that got me to where I am today with my career. So uh, a big um, vote of thanks and can we join together um, to thank the students. Thank you. Thanks, Louis. Well, strap yourselves in. We're about to be taken to the extreme realms of medicine, introducing four extremists. The room's full of extremists, but we're just choosing four of you, who will take you from Antarctica to remote Australia, then out to the Pacific Islands, before flinging you into space. I hope you're ready. It's about to get extreme. You know, if you didn't take your um, Zoffran uh, before you came in, I should take it now, just in case it gets too giddy for you. It's now my pleasure to hand the reins uh, over to Akram Future Gens Committee Chair, Dr. Tendai Miller, uh, Australian Medical and Australian Medical, Asso Australian Medical Students Association National Chair, Jasmine Davis. Please welcome Tendai, Jasmine, and the Extreme Team. Good morning, everyone. My name is Tendai Miller. I'm the chair of the Akram Future Generalist Committee. And hi, everyone. I'm Jasmine. I'm the current president of the Australian Medical Students Association and also a member of the Future Gens Committee. Thank you. Uh, we're very excited this morning to be uh, hosting this session. We have an exciting lineup of speakers. And I'll go from my right, um, going this way. Uh, we have Dr. John Cherry, who will be speaking on aerospace medicine. We have Dr. Alison Hampenstall, who will be speaking on remote Australia. We have Dr. Kate Closer, who will be speaking on the Australian Antarctic Program and Dr. Dan Manahan, who will be sharing on Pacific Island primary health. So the way we'll do it is we'll begin to hear from each of our panelists, and then at the end of when they've all spoken, we'll give you all a chance to ask the questions that you have. There'll be mics in the audience. Uh, so as we start, I'll start off with you, um, uh, Dr. Cherry. Um, please let us know a bit about what you do. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to begin by also recognising uh, the traditional owners of the land that we're meeting on today and paying my respects to elders past, present and emerging. My name is uh, John Cherry. I'm a, a new ACRAM fellow um, and also chair of the Space Life Sciences Committee and uh, company director for the Australasian Society for Aerospace Medicine. Um, I'm very lucky in that role that I get to work with a number of organisations such as the Australian Space Agency, the Federal Government, the CSIRO, uh, and another, a number of industry partners, such as the university sector, uh, to promote aerospace medicine, but more specifically, space medicine. Uh, aerospace medicine often incorporates uh, civil and, uh, and commercial flying of, of aircraft, uh, but my real focus is on uh, what happens uh, above the atmosphere uh, and supporting a human space flight now and into the future. Um, I think it's a really important time to talk about space medicine, and I'll talk about some opportunities uh, that exist for Australia within the field, but I wanted to provide a bit of an insight into where we're at with uh, uh, the, the current environment for space medicine and why this is an important topic to discuss now. So on the slide uh, behind me, you can see uh, an orbital plot for the Artemis One mission, 
This is part of NASA's program to go back to the moon. For those who have been watching the news, you may have seen uh, the Artemis uh, 1 mission that had a, a failed, well, not a failed, a delayed launch um, a few weeks ago, and that launch has been pushed back until November. Uh, but that will be the first mission around the moon since the Apollo era. It will be an unmanned uh, mission that will progress around the moon. That will be followed by Artemis 2, which will follow the same orbital trajectory, uh, but with a crewed uh, capsule instead of an empty capsule. Uh, and this is important. Again, it will be the first uh, mission around the moon uh, since the Apollo era that's carried a crew. But it will also be the uh, furthest that human beings have ever travelled from the surface of the Earth because of the nature of the orbit around the moon. It will actually place the astronauts much further from Earth than the Apollo era. Artemis 3 will then follow that. Artemis 3 is the objective of placing astronauts on the surface of the moon uh, and then returning them back to Earth's surface. Again, obviously the first time since the Apollo era. And then excitingly, Artemis 4 uh, is uh, the development of effectively a lunar space station in what's called a, a gateway orbit, which will act as a, a research uh, centre, but also a logistics hub for future missions to the lunar surface, but also future missions beyond and onwards to Mars. It sounds like science fiction, but it's actually happening right now. And we have an opportunity um, as rural generalists and also uh, as uh, Australians to contribute to this in a way that very few other nations have, and I'll talk more about that later. As an introduction to a, a sort of a broad overview of, of what comes next, well, within the space medicine sphere, there's an opportunity or hopefully future opportunities for um, Australian space medicine training. So space medicine being the support of human spaceflight. And that could come in a number of forms in terms of a clinical support or research support or working in space analogue environments. The idea of uh, supporting that Australian research in space medicine under a, um, an umbrella organisation uh, based hopefully in a, um, in a centre where there are strong links to uh, re remote medicine environments and um, other analogue environments. Uh, and then looking at actually uh, bringing Australians into the, the process of actively supporting human spaceflight. Uh, that process at the moment is undertaken by predominantly NASA and, and the European Space Agency, where I've been uh, lucky to, to work for both organisations um, over recent years. Um, and we're in a position now where we can step up, uh, we can bring our skills as rural journalists and uh, as, as a nation uh, to this endeavour to return astronauts to the moon, but not just for a short duration, uh, actually with the establishment of uh, uh, lunar habitats and then onwards to, to Mars, which poses other problems as well. So I hope that provides a, a short overview. I appreciate that that may look like science fiction, but it is uh, <laughs> very much reality. Thank you, Dr. Cherry. <laughs> In your introduction, you touched on um, the importance of space medicine in exploring missions to deep space. But can you just touch on a bit on how people can get involved in the field of space medicine? It's a, it's a really pertinent question. It's probably one of the most common questions I get when I speak at events or uh, uh, you know, appear at conferences. The, the, the reality is uh, space medicine as a clinical initiative for clinical support of human spaceflight occurs through partner organisations such as NASA and the European Space Agency. They have requirements for nationality. Um, so if you want to work for NASA, you need to be ideally an American citizen. Uh, if you want to work for the European Space Agency, you need to hold EU citizenship. But that shouldn't be a barrier to actually working within the field of space medicine. So rural generalism provides many of the uh, same challenges and same opportunities as, as spaceflight working with remote communities in isolated settings, those clinical skills will be essential for supporting crews who are uh, on extended duration missions uh, into deep space. Uh, but beyond that, there's an opportunity also for, for research. Um, uh, I acknowledge, for example, some, some leaders in the room, such as Dr. Jeff Ayton with the uh, Polar Medicine Unit at the Australian Antarctic Division, who has collaborated with NASA in his role for a, a, a number of years, and uh, Dr. Des Lug, who was in that position before him as well, who signed a memorandum of understanding with, with NASA as a Antarctica being a space analogue environment, provides that opportunity for research within, for example, space analogues, uh, Antarctica being a key one. 
Uh, I think you look at things like the Centre for Antarctic Remote and Maritime Medicine, CALM, which is based down in Hobart as a, an umbrella organisation which brings in uh, rural generalism, uh, maritime medicine, remote medicine and space medicine, and the opportunity to partner with organisations such as that for either clinical or, or research initiatives. Uh, but I think it's also about the um, engaging with organisations as well. So the Australasian Society of Aerospace Medicine has a growing uh, space medicine kind of interest area. The College of the Australasian College for Aerospace Medicine is looking at um, uh, uh, space medicine training pathways for Australian citizens, partnering with the Australian Space Agency and partner organisations. Um, so the opportunities are really there. I was really heartened, uh, and I won't embarrass them, but by one of the, my colleagues here at the uh, the conference who mentioned that they're hoping to get a paper published soon on a particular drug that would be, uh, the effects would be extremely useful for long duration space flight in terms of uh, bone protection. Uh, he's a rural generalist working within Australia, but has that interest and that research um, could be game changing for that particular part of clinical care for astronauts. So the opportunity is there. There are, um, as, as we step forward with more funding from the government, there'll be further opportunities, hopefully as the space agency's roots become more grounded. But I think you're looking at the moment, either rural generalism, working with organisations such as the Australian Antarctic Division, working with organisations such as um, the, the, the Royal Hobart Hospital with a hyperbaric unit which has um, many uh, applications for space flight, uh, and then looking at research as well. Okay, thank you. And uh, now we'll get to hear from Dr. Alison Happenstell. Mm. Thank you. I'm uh, Alison uh, Fakram, based on Thursday Island in the Torres Strait and firmly have my feet planted on Earth and probably <laughs> will for, forevermore. Um, uh, today I'm going to share my experiences of, of living and working in uh, what I see as the most magical place in Australia and if not the world. And thinking about the composition of the panel today, I really didn't think that living on Thursday Island was extreme. And then I thought of my journey home tomorrow. I'll be getting three plane flights, two buses and a boat. And I thought, maybe it is a bit extreme. <laughs> <laughs> so I work for the Torres and Cape Hospital and Health Service as a GP and over the last 18 months also as their sole public health medical officer. And you can see their services span a huge distance in far north Queensland from a few hours north of Cairns all the way to the border of Papua New Guinea. There's about 25,000 people there. Two thirds of those identify as Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander. And you can see there in the very small red dots all the primary health care centres that we service across the area. There are 31 of those and they're mainly led by health workers and nurses with fly-in, fly-out doctors. We also have four hospitals, one in Weeper, Cooktown, Bamaga and Thursday Island. Here's my home for the last four years. And I was going to circle where I lived and then thought I probably shouldn't. <laughs> um, uh, but you can see the hospital down there with the helipad that we have frequent um, uh, retrievals and also clinics that we fly out from. Thursday Island is home to the Kaurig people. It's also known as Wyburn. There's about 4,000 people that uh, reside in and around Thursday Island. And then another 4,000 that live um, and work in the 18 inhabited outer islands that make up the Torres Strait. And we service both Thursday Island and all those outer islands. You can see the hospital there, which is about 20 beds. And we provide emergency, maternity uh, care, as well as having a general ward. And then we use that helipad, which I have been on more towns than I can count, uh, to fly out to remote outer islands to provide healthcare. And that goes to the outer islands all the way up to the PNG border, which, because of COVID, has been closed for the last two and a half years, but will reopen next week. And we're looking forward to welcoming and caring for our PNG uh, cousins who will be across the border there. Working in the Torres Strait is absolutely incredible and a real privilege. You can see that it is logistically a complex place to provide health care um, from plane trips, helicopters, boat rides, uh, car trips. We use all modalities of transport to deliver health care um, all the way out to um, all the outer islands. 
And the burden of disease, I used to call it a, a double burden of disease, but I've now broadened that to a triple burden of disease. You have non-communicable diseases, which are incredibly uh, or all too present in this population, including chronic kidney disease, type 2 diabetes, ischemic heart disease. You then have communicable diseases that you will not see anywhere else in Australia, including tuberculosis, leprosy, meliodosis. And then you have this, this third burden of what I call environmental disease. So croc bites, jellyfish stings, snake bites, um, uh, things that are, are common in remote Australia, but just as common in this part of the world here. I think it's the best place to, to live and work. And we are always looking for doctors. And so if anyone is interested, I'm uh, very happy to, to speak to you afterwards. Thanks. Thanks very much for that, Alison. I think um, I'd be interested to hear about what skills you think have been most useful and relevant to your time up in Thursday Island and maybe how they relate to your training through ACRAM. It makes obvious sense that in a remote place like this, procedural skills are highly advantageous. In saying that, I don't have a procedural skill <laughs> and I'm able to provide uh, high quality services to the community there. So coming to a place like this with obstetrics, anaesthetics, surgery emergency skills are highly valued. Um, but having a robust knowledge and background in primary care, which is what we live and breathe and is our bread and butter. Probably what's more important than skills are particular attributes to living in the Torres and Cape or in any remote location. And they would include flexibility and creativity. Places like this work on their own time, and it is very different to suburban, regional, or metropolitan Australia. And so being able to work flexibly is really important, but also creative, creatively. Often you don't have the resources at your fingertips that you would like, um, and you have to think outside the box. And I think that's one of the areas that I enjoy most about not fitting within the convention and having to creatively problem solve when a patient comes to me or I'm presented with an issue. Something else I think really important, but probably isn't widely touched upon in working in remote Australia, is having good personal insight. This is probably a good attribute for everyone in medicine, but quite often there are people who end up in these remote locations and don't really understand why they've ended up in these particular locations and may not recognise the signs and symptoms of when they need to leave that particular community or have a small break. When I am living on Thursday Island, I am only a doctor. That is not the only part of who I am as a person, but is, is the only um, part of my identity that is portrayed when I'm there. So it's really important that I take time away out from that area. Having that insight is really important to my longevity in that region. And I would encourage anyone who is thinking of living and working in remote Australia to understand your reasonings why you want to go there and what your commitment is to the region. I think my final point are some really pivotal words that for those of you who may know, Dr Jack Sloss, he's a rural generalist on Thursday Island, has been for the last decade, and he's got dreadlocks down halfway down his back. He said to me when I left there in 2016 as a junior doctor and I was interested in coming back, he said, if you're going to come back, come for at least two years. It's going to take you the first year just to understand the community and then the second year or more to provide continuity of care. These communities, time in and time out, have a revolving door of staff, unfortunately such as the nature of remote medicine. But they, co they deserve a continuity of care. And I think for anyone who is interested in moving to a remote location in Australia, knowing your commitment to the area and your commitment to providing continuity of care to your patients is vital. Thanks. Thank you. Mm. And now we have the pleasure of hearing from Dr. Kate Clauser. 
Hi, uh, my name's Kate. Um, I'm a Fakram as well. Um, and my remote AST, uh, my AST is in remote health. And um, before I start, I'd really like to acknowledge both Dr. Jeff Ayton and Akram, um, because I didn't start this pathway as wanting to be a rural generalist or even knowing much about it. And it was thanks to the incredible opportunity offered to me um, in going down to Antarctica that my career took a wonderful 90 degree turn and I do not want to look back. Um, so yeah, it's incredible the opportunities that are available um, through working with the Australian Antarctic program. Um, so there's sort of three key areas really, I guess, when you talk about working in Antarctica is the environment, the job and the place. Um, so the Australian Antarctic program has been operating continuously down in Antarctica um, since the polar heroic era of 1947. Um, and we now operate four, ba uh, four bases, three in the continental Antarctic and one in the sub-Antarctic of Macquarie Island, as well as opportunities to work on research um, vessels, um, doing science in the Southern Ocean. And now there's also um, becoming a modern traverse capability um, with deep inland projects um, like the Million Year Ice Core that will be departing this year. Um, everyone's probably heard the adage of Antarctica that it's the coldest, windiest, driest place on Earth. Um, and that's very true, <laughs> it definitely is. Um, and that's certainly one of the factors that you contend with um, both as an expeditioner and as a doctor um, when you're working down there and a lot of your clinical presentations are related to that, whether it's um, sort of more minor things like people seeing you with very dry sinuses constantly, to then looking at things like different rashes and cold injuries um, that people might experience, as well as issues related um, to the isolation and the confinement of living with the same 20 people day in and day out for 12 months at a time. Um, and Macquarie Island is slightly different, being a sub-Antarctic island. If you ask Macquarie Island expeditioners, um, they'll tell you they live on the wettest, windiest, boggiest, muddiest place on Earth, um, because that's an island um, that gets 360 days of rainfall, and if you're not walking up a massive steep hill to go up and over the plateau, you're walking through a quaking bog where at any point your foot goes through the grass and you're swimming in water. Um, so it's an exciting environment, but that tends to more have water-related cold injuries um, associated with it. But it does have incredible year-round wildlife. Um, so this is a bit more of a graphic um, on the job. The Australian Antarctic program works on the solo medical practitioner model. Um, in terms of on the ground medical support, you are the solo trained medical person. Um, but that's backed up with a 24-7 um, telemedicine support. Um, it's comprised of three doctors working at um, the Australian Antarctic Division head office, who are all three rural generalists as well. And then through the CALM network, that links in um, with other specialists to provide that additional support. Um, the telemedicine comes through a variety of ways. Um, we have the electronic health record um, that can be viewed back in real time in Australia, as well as real time um, patient monitoring through the Epifan broadcaster and devices like the ProEX. Um, we also have um, increasing video um, capability um, that allows for real time um, monitoring. This is really important because being 24 seven on call, um, it actually allows the doctor on station the opportunity to have some rest, to have some sleep, and another doctor to then take over and monitor that patient for you in real time, should there be a significant med medical event. But really, and those things do happen, those sort of halo events, but um, for the broad majority of the work, they need really solid rural generalists down there. Most of your work is everything that we're all excellent at doing every day. It's seeing those GP consultations, it's putting the connection between the psychosocial and the medical, it's being able to support people through family crises, through isolation, through stress, um, as well as through their physical illnesses. We do have a highly screened population, um, so you don't see the same level of chronic disease down there that you would say in somewhere like Allison's environment, um, but that's not to say new things don't crop up when you're down there. So in terms of the place, um, you work out of a stationed medical facility and it feels exactly almost like a lot of the wonderfully well-equipped rural places I've worked in 
um, where there's um, a resus bay, there's a, a GP consulting room, there's a dental room, there's a lab, there's a two-bed ward, there's a theatre um, and a scrub room and a pharmacy. So it's like being in, in your own small country hospital, except when you look out the window, you have the most extraordinary view of either Antarctica or the sub-Antarctic. Um, so uh, for the deep field, there's now being a traverse sled and a traverse capability um, with that where they will have a medical facility that will go um, on the back of that tractor train um, to provide that medical support to the deep field. And we also have an extensive medical support um, on the ship with the new medical facility on the Nuina. Um, and then also the containerized medical facility, which is a standardized shipping container that goes the back on, onto the back of any contracted ship that the AAD uses. And that's all linked in with our telehealth system. So in addition to your medical work there, you're an absolute key part of the community. Um, you participate in station life with additional roles like being the librarian, hydroponics, involved in parties, as well as doing the dishes and slushy and vacuuming the corridors because that needs to get done too. Um, there's lots of recreational opportunities to go out and see the extraordinary environment. Um, and it's just an incredible opportunity. The typical deployment that you're actually on station is, is 12 to 14 months, but there, it's about an 18 month commitment with the um, pre-departure training that you undergo. But there's increasing opportunities for shorter deployments, particularly with the new Traverse capability and the increased science funding that we've got. Um, so that can mean things like a short summer that might be anywhere from three to five months or a round trip voyage that could be four to six weeks. Um, so I'll just finish with that picture because it really wouldn't be an Antarctic talk without a picture of penguins. So there's our emperor penguins. <laughs> Thank you, Kate. I take my hat off to you because I've um, only recently moved to Orange Health Service and just getting used to the cold and the snow, I can only <laughs> imagine <laughs> what it's like for you. Um, you've touched on um, the different um, work you're doing in Antarctica and I understand the communities are quite different and not representative of the broader Australian uh, community. As a rural generalist, how do you keep up to date with other aspects of your training or, or health in seeing other patients such as obstetrics, pediatrics or geriatric medicine? How do you uh, keep up with yeah, look, it's a, it's a really good question because it's definitely not the average Australian population um, that, you, that you're seeing down there. We see a highly screened population that's passed an extensive medical and because of the remoteness um, and the limited lab capabilities as, as excellent as it is um, of what we have down there, we, it's just not safe to have someone with, who is dependent for their ongoing health and safety um, on medication. Um, so you don't see that chronic disease that makes up um, so much of the, of the regular um, and Australian-based general practice. There's obviously no children down on station, um, so you, you don't see any paediatrics. Um, you don't see any care of older people as well. We don't see palliation. So you are seeing a, a particular niche of medicine. And in some ways, it's really beneficial because I've found as a, as a woman um, rural generalist, my patients who see me in Australia tend to self-select me, which tends to be younger women um, and women of childbearing years. So wanting to talk about contraception, um, antenatal appointments, even though I'm not a, a, a GP obstetrician and a lot of mental health. Because most of our stations are predominantly male, it's around 80% expeditioners. One of the great things of going south is it's really allowed me to develop a different style of, of consulting skills to be able to consult and understand um, and have more extensive practice in men's health um, and men's health concerns. And so that's been really nice that it's been a, a two-way street of learning um, that I've gained that from going down there. And then when I return to Australia, um, I really try and seek out those things that I haven't seen um, when I'm down there. Um, one of the things with isolation um, down in Antarctica and, and anywhere in these remote communities is it can be really easy to get disconnected from peers and to become geographically as well as professionally um, isolated. And that's where I find for myself staying connected through um, lots of different social networks and GP forums like GPs Down Under and Twitter connects me 
um, with other doctors and I can then use their knowledge and skills um, to support me in, in my learning and practice of, of those areas that I've missed out on when I'm down south. And it's been really nice then to be able to do things like a case discussion with them, share ideas and thoughts on my management till I get a bit more confident with seeing those things that I haven't had the opportunity for 12 months to do. Thank you. <laughs> and now we'll get to hear from Dr. Dan Manahan. Thank you. Um, thank you to the Ngunnawal people for having me on land. Um, there we go. Uh, just, um, I'll start with the story. There's a, a lot of uh, one-legged 40-year-old Polynesians uh, as a result of the chronic disease burden in the Pacific. Uh, Amone, one of our trainees, is um, in Harp High, um, and uh, he's doing a clinic. Harp High is the middle group of islands in Tonga, uh, in the three groups, so it's quite remote. Uh, it's a small island. So he's doing a clinic on a further out western island uh, and uh, he's in a nurse run clinic seeing a man who is on a further island out again. Um, and this uh, fellow's uh, come in by boat to this clinic today and he's seeing uh, Amone with a quite nasty diabetic foot ulcer and uh, peripheral vascular disease. And Amone examines him uh, takes a history and uh, advises him that you're probably going to need care back in Harp High and maybe uh, you'll have to take the overnight boat back to Tongatapu, the main island, to the Tertiary National Hospital um, where you might need treatment uh, to save the leg. And of course this gentleman says, uh, no thank you, um, I can't be away from my family. So sounds familiar, I'm sure, to many of us. Um, so Amone examines him, he uh, takes a history, he basically then advocates for him, he contacts him again by telehealth, uh, provides him with a continuity option uh, and uh, develops rapport, does some video conferencing and, and eventually uh, this guy decides to come back to Harpai. He has treatment for his leg, uh, he gets his diabetes and hypertension sharpened up and eventually he and his leg make it back home. So this is um, the cradle to grave care um, that we all experience in, in rural generalism. And, and as a discipline, it really is largely unknown in the Pacific Islands. Uh, you graduate in many locations, including Tonga, and there's a smorgasbord of, uh, of specialty options of which general practice, primary care and rural generalism just isn't on the list or hasn't been on the list. And we did, we've done a couple of country needs analysis and when we introduced the concept of uh, rural generalist or primary care options, um, doctors really were firstly quite astounded that this was an option and secondly um, really excited to be actually looking at that as a vocational option. So um, Amone was one of my trainees. Um, uh, when I was working as, a, as part of rocket ship and we were providing uh, distance modelling education supervision and I would ring him quite regularly um, and on one occasion uh, he'd just come in from, uh, he was in, doing ENT was his substantive role prior to this and um, he'd just come in from a surgical list and he'd just finished a craniotomy for a patient with mastoiditis here I am on the phone talking to him about hypertension management and diabetes and he's just walked in after a craniotomy and think, wow. Very skilled doctors um, in, in many places in the Pacific. Uh, but his real passion became um, the option of this uh, family medicine program, the joy that comes with the continuity of um, care that can come from uh, family medicine practice. Um, so largely, a lot of the work we do in rocket ship is based on, um, well firstly it's by invitation and in partnership with uh, local ministries of health. And, and local ministries of health have now in recent years um, through uh, conferences like this and, and the world movement around rural journalism, they've had their eyes opened to rural journalism and they really do like what they're seeing and, and in many places they're voting with their feet and looking at developing uh, new courses uh, for, for their 
their doctors across their own countries. Um, the courses we're involved with largely run off uh, a distance modelling platform very similar to RVTS and ACRAM Independent Pathway. And it's, it's uh, not a surprise that two of our early board members were um, Pat Giddings and David Cam uh, Campbell, uh, who you, many of you will know well. Um, and, and that fits the model quite nicely uh, for service delivery in this area uh, across the Pacific Islands um, that we work in. Uh, Amone's patient was able to benefit from the hallmarks of good general practice, uh, continuity of care that Alison talked about a minute ago, uh, chronic disease management and preventive health care. And these hallmarks are the same in Australia as they are all around the world and, and in the Pacific. Um, at Rocket Ship, uh, we think that um, these qualifications for doctors is going to be a game changer for Pacific Island patients. Um, we believe that some of the programs we're involved with um, are deliverable, they're scalable, and we actively work towards succession planning to make these programs deliverable autonomously in country without our help um, when the time is right. And uh, we believe we're just at the beginning. Thank you. Thanks very much for that, Dan. I think um, something that is really interesting in this space, and I'd also like to ask the rest of the panel this afterwards, is the impact of climate change um, on these communities. And is that part of the curriculum and is that part of the conversation and learning about the future? Thanks, Jazz. Yeah, um, no one really knows, about, um, knows more about climate change than uh, Pacific Islanders. And the Pacific Island doctors that we're involved with, um, they, they are well aware of the, the impacts and it's, it's, it's in the forefront of most of the work we, we, we are doing with them. Um, specifically in curricula, the um, emergency components, uh, both in curriculum and workshop training, uh, cover off on things like uh, storms, climatic changes around cyclones, tsunamis, and things in that very elemental sort of stage. Um, but the um, thread of um, changes in infectious disease through vector changes, uh, food security, and uh, the mental health stress that comes from climate change, it, it's really interwoven through the whole curricula. Um, it, there are components in the curricula that specifically address it. Uh, and there's significant public health components in, in most curricula. Um, but it, it tends to be interwoven through um, a lot of uh, the case presentations and, and work that we do. Okay, and we are going to open up to questions in a moment, so if people wanted to pop their hands up. But I would also like to hear from Kate um, the impact of climate change in the sort of space that you're working in as well. Yeah, absolutely. Look, I, I think we're all well aware of um, the impact of climate change on Antarctica. Um, and it's certainly something that, that we're seeing in the day-to-day -day realities of, of operating both in the medical spaces and in the science. So a lot of the science that we're down there supporting as, as Antarctic medical practitioners is, is climate science. So part of the Million Year Ice Core Project um, is to get that record um, of the climate and to understand climate more and what's happened and hopefully come up with some mitigation strategies before it's too late. There's also some incredible work um, that's going to be happening out in the Bunga Hills area, um, looking there as well at changes to the glacier. So the work in Antarctica is really informing the body of science around um, climate change, how it's happening, what's actually happening. Um, but of course, we still need action to prevent it happening. It's all very well to be, to be there recording it. Um, so we, we still absolutely need that climate action um, to respond to it. We're also similarly um, to, to in the Pacific seeing disease vector changes um, as areas that aren't meant to be ice-free become ice-free as they become warmer, as there's changes in, in plant and animal life. Um, there's a lot of concerns at the moment around emerging infections that we may not know a lot about because normally they wouldn't survive in Antarctica. And that's as much us bringing them in with our clothing, with our foods um, and the other equipment that we bring into Antarctica as well as us 
being in those environments and having the zoonotic infections through the birds. So it's certainly an area of, of emerging concern. Mm. And Alison, how about you? Just to add to Dan and Kate's sentiments, Torres Strait Islanders know all too well the impact of climate change on their low-lying islands. Visiting a number of years ago to the clinics, you see sandbags piling up on the seashore. This then has a triple, ripple down effect on increasing water temperatures, which impacts fishing seasons, which impacts food security, impacts a burden of communicable and non-communicable diseases. It goes right through communities. You probably know that there was um, a landmark win recently by the Torres Strait Eight uh, against their, with their human rights case against the national government towards their inaction on climate change. And it is deeply unfortunate that those who have the smallest carbon footprint are those who bear the greatest weight of the impact of climate change. And it's something absolutely should be on our agenda and we should be actively striving towards change. Thank you. And John, how about space? <laughs> <laughs> I think, um, you know, space flight since the, since the early days of, of, of human beings transitioning from the surface of the Earth into the upper atmosphere, there's been an increased focus on the science of our planet that's come with that. Um, much of that science is now automated through satellite technology. Uh, but a lot of the science is still undertaken aboard the International Space Station with astronauts from partner organisations and space, um, uh, either commercial spaceflight organisations or, or, or national um, uh, space organisations such as NASA and ESA. A lot of that research is still fundamental to us understanding the world that we live in. Um, you'll often hear astronauts who return from the space station uh, have a profoundly different view of the Earth um, from when they left. Um, it's a, a phrase or a terminology that's called the overview effect and there's some uh, contention around if it's a, a genuine psychological principle or not but the idea being that uh, observing the earth from space and seeing the fragility of the atmosphere, the fragility of the environment um, provides a, a profound perspective change for those individuals. Um, as doctors uh, we have a responsibility to support our patients and within a spaceflight environment your patients are obviously astronauts who are in a fairly challenging environment those astronauts are doing the the work much like in an Antarctic context to a context doing the work to promote science and improve our understanding of the world so although climate change and sort of deep space flight might not seem like they're too comparable there's actually a, a, a nice overlap there thank you all righty we're gonna open to the audience Please raise your hand if you have a question and we'll get a microphone to you. And we may kindly ask for the lights a bit so we can see everyone. Yes, that's so I'll, great. I'll, I'll, <coughs> I'll break the um, mm -hmm. ice and ask a quick question to mm -hmm. Kate. Is that true you have to electively remove your appendix if we're going to Antarctica? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, yes. Um, so for any, it's only for the doctors and it's only for the Australian Antarctic program. Other countries manage it differently, but um, yes, if you do wish to winter in Antarctica, you will need to have your prophylactic appendicectomy. Wow. Hey, I think we've got one here. Yep, Alan. Hi, Alan Sanford. Um, John, I'm a Star Trek Fan. So uh, Jean-Luc Picard is one of my heroes. Do you see the role of uh, space health as perhaps a advanced skills that may fit within ACRAM? It's pretty remote. It, it is pretty remote. Uh, I think ACRAM is uniquely placed to contribute to this space, forgive the pun. Um, the, the, the reason being that um, the challenges that we face with rural and remote communities are exactly the same challenges that will be faced as we place um, human crews uh, into uh, beyond low Earth orbit missions. So at the moment, the International Space Station, if there's a medical emergency, you can get someone back from the space station within a 24-hour period. If you're putting people on the moon, uh, it's probably a two-week period. If you're putting people to Mars, 
it's probably a nine month period before you can get a medical evacuation. So there's a, an element of um, uh, isolated teams that need to be able to operate in, in isolation, probably with a medical officer that's with them, um, probably with a, a ideally at someone who has a broad range of skills, a rural generalist type model would be ideal. Um, but then there's also the remote support that comes with that as well. So the remote support from individuals on the ground who have the medical knowledge, but also the understanding of the context, which is key that they're in. Um, and recognising that as we transfer or, or move further away from Earth, we also get a time delay as well. So up to a 45 minute time delay for uh, a mission to Mars. So looking at how we can build systems that will allow remote operators, remote communities, access to reasonable levels of healthcare um, that we should be providing to our patients and should be supporting them with. Um, and that's a process that's underway at the moment. You know, the NASA don't have the answers to that. They um, are open that they don't have the, a way to solve that. Uh, within Australia, we have systems, we have uh, training, we have telemedicine capabilities, we have retrieval options, we have uh, a college that is focused on rural generalism that has many of those answers already. The Canadian Space Agency earlier this year released a report on what they call deep space health and they recognise that Australia are leaders, world leaders, when it comes to rural and remote health. Canada have some um, programs, obviously, in, in rural and remote health as well, but they recognise the Australian experience and the Australian context. So I think with um, the development of this area, I think ACRAM has a really unique opportunity, not to only contribute to rural and remote communities in Australia, but to contribute to these broader ambitions for human spaceflight, the learnings of which will also be useful for rural and, commu rural and remote communities in Australia. And we see that trickle down of knowledge um, from spaceflight, and we've seen it since the 1960s. So I would be very hopeful that ACRAM can engage, and I obviously am biased, but I'd, I'd obviously push for that as well. Thank you. Yes? Middle here. Hi, everyone. Uh, Anthony from RFDS in Western Australia. Uh, thank you for all for speaking. Um, very inspiring stories. Now, um, my question is about uh, some of your skills and interests outside of medicine. I'm aware that quite a few on the panel have got a lot of fantastic skills. And I know I picked on Kate yesterday about her amazing photography. Um, and I know that John had lots of great chats over there as a fellow aviator and sharing some stories that we've had. Um, I just wanted to ask the panel how your skills outside of medicine have influenced uh, how you've gone into an extreme medicine, how they've contributed to what you do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, Kate, did you want to start with that then? Yeah, sure. <laughs> um, so thank you so much. Um, lovely question. Um, so, it, yeah, how my hobbies have sort of contributed to the skills in remote medicine is really, it was more my hobbies how I got into um, extreme medicine. So um, I've always loved bushwalking. I've loved the outdoors. I always wanted to see snow, having grown up in Queensland, where that wasn't really an option. Um, so the idea of going to an environment where I could live 24-7 in snow, um, get to experience blizzards, get this whole other world, it, it was really what attracted me there. And I think a lot of the stuff that you learn when you're outside in the bush and bushwalking really helps with remote medicine. It's that capacity to be comfortable with yourself, with your own thoughts that capacity to be comfortable with a certain degree of uncertainty, particularly when you're off track bushwalking and you're self-navigating, um, that you've picked a path, you're trusting where you're going, you're constantly seeking that new information from your environment that you're going in the right way, that self-confidence within yourself that you're not constantly second-guessing the decisions that you've made. Um, I, I think, yeah, there's a lot of parallels between bushwalking and, and remote medicine. Um, so that's certainly been, been one of the big ways that got me into it and also keeps me going um, in remote medicine. Yeah. That's a really interesting question. Um, thank you for asking it. I'd probably say a skill that I have outside of medicine is baking. I love to bake. And every clinic uh, laps up any kind of cookie, slice, cake <laughs> that I might bring. I become the, the favourite person there if I come bearing sweet, sweet treats. 
um, but, uh, much probably to the disarray of the average HbA1c that <laughs> is in that community. Um, uh, uh, but that's probably a skill that I bring from outside of medicine into my day-to-day -day practice. I love the question. I've never really thought I'd get asked that today, but uh, I'd probably pick up with Kate. I, I think um, bushwalking and a uh, love of nature um, probably dovetails nicely to my involvement in the Pacific space. Um, I've also got um, a strong faith and a strong belief in equity, which is one of the rocket ship goals uh, and values, and, and just, you know, that uh, everybody has a right to universal health care. Um, as, you, as people were, were speaking, I was thinking, well, how am I going to answer this question? And um, I thought, well, one of the things I do do when I travel around um, working um, that I've found really useful over the years is I always go to the botanical gardens and I always go to the art gallery where there is one. Uh, it kind of gives you a, a bit of an... In it's free, so it's cheap. <laughs> um, and it gives you a bit of an insight into the community and uh, it's, a, it's a nice sort of zen thing to do when you just want to hang out in a new environment, but, uh, and it's a nice safe space. So, yeah. Um, yeah, great question. Uh, I came to Australia from, from London um, about 17 years ago, and I came in a different career as a, an astrophysicist, and I was um, working at the Australian National University to create one of the first 3D maps of the universe. Um, which was, uh, sounds much more exciting than it actually was. It was a lot of <laughs> computer time and, and, and staring at a screen. Um, and from that, um, moved on to become a, a commercial helicopter pilot and a, a, a high school science teacher and, and uh, an expedition leader, leading scientific expeditions to various exciting places around the world. Um, and that kind of experience, I think, helped me understand the context for then when I entered the... Uh, entered the medical field and, and realised that I wanted to try and pursue this and, and try and uh, support you know, human space flight in, in whatever capacity I could, uh, which then led to an opportunity to go and work for NASA and, and, and um, uh, help develop their telemedicine capabilities for a future Mars mission, uh, and then uh, ended up working at the European Space Agency, um, redeveloping their medical training program for their astronaut corps um, uh, and the, the hands-on medical training that they get uh, before they go to space, which we've now had um, five astronauts fly to the space station having undergone that training, which is very exciting. Um, but those, those experiences, you know, the experience with NASA and ESA in isolation can seem quite surreal, but it's really a, a, a built on a, a trajectory and a background of engagement in understanding the context and uh, developing key skills that are useful in that environment. And I think that's provided me with the opportunity to uh, pursue the field. I can attest to the fact that John also has the longest post nominals of anyone <laughs> I've ever met. Um, <laughs> yes, any more questions? Yeah. Hi, um, thank you everyone for speaking. My name is Jacinta and I'm a junior doctor just starting my RG training. Uh, so my question is, I've always thought of extreme medicine and think it sounds amazing, um, but hearing from everyone, it sounds like you need the skills already going out to these remote communities. Are there any training opportunities and what's your advice to sort of budding extreme medicine um, practitioners? Um, look, in the Pacific, um, there are opportunities for students in a variety of places um, uh, that um, are established. Um, certainly in Tonga and East Timor, there are conduits into those spaces. Um, most of the work we do, we, we select um, people who apply for roles in education and most of them are at supervisor level with some background experience. So you are right, that, that is um, our kind of core business. And every now and then we'll do clinical service delivery and then we'll be, again, mostly looking at um, that group. But, um, you know, what's in front of us, we're not sure and uh, there may be opportunities in the future. Watch this space. This is a great opportunity and thank you so much for asking that question for me to get on my absolute favourite bandwagon, which is you can train for Akram in Antarctica. It is absolutely possible and it's exactly what I did. Um, so um, Dr Jeff Asian, who's the Chief Medical Officer, um, has ensured that the Polar Medicine Unit is accredited for both primary, rural and remote time. 
um, as well as the opportunity to do your advanced skill um, in remote medicine in Antarctica. So for my first year when I went down to Casey, that was accredited for my primary and rural remote time, fell in love with the place, applied to um, in the open competitive application process um, to do my AST and made sure I put that in the application. So there's definitely training um, opportunities out there for registrars. The main thing I would say around it is it really requires planning. The remote health AST requires you to prospectively apply for your project. So before you start your actual rotation in your community, you need to have that approved. The other thing is that like all um, medical jobs, they happen on a cyclical structured basis. So the Australian Antarctic Division opens um, their job applications in December. So if you go to jobs.antarctica.gov.au, um, you can have a look at the jobs. Um, and the Antarctic Medical Pac Practitioner um, position opens up um, for that. Um, and so you just need that planning because it, currently it's around one to two years out of, uh, ahead of the time to do your AST that you have to put that application in. Um, but I would strongly encourage anyone that wants to train in Antarctica to do so. It's an incredibly supportive environment. We have a fortnight, uh, sorry, a weekly um, meeting with all of the other polar medicine unit doctors where you have case um, based discussions, professional support with each other. There's also online training tutorials and we also develop um, really strong quest, uh, friendships with each other. Um, so I'm going to embarrass Johnny here, but um, we were down at Davis together and we spent a lot of time on the phone talking to each other, uh, both about clinical work, professional work and just general support. So. Um, if you're at all thinking about training in Antarctica, honestly, I can't speak highly enough of it. Do it. It's amazing. It's life-changing. It's the greatest job on earth. <laughs> Have fun after yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, in the interest of time, I think we're just oh, going to whip through a couple more quick questions down the front here. Clyde Ronan, GP from Yarrawonga. Question for Dr. Closer and Dr. Cherry, because I can see some similarities. <coughs> Uh, Dr. Philip Law was the inaugural director of ANARI and for the next 19 years, every year he went down to Antarctica, he was motion sick all the way. But it didn't stop him going back. Do you have any special insights uh, with the benefit of hindsight how we could have helped him? <laughs> <laughs> um, I have a running joke that I call the first three days of the ship the Southern Ocean Weight Loss Program because most people <laughs> uh, are not doing well. Um, there, there's varying levels of, of seasickness, but there's not a whole lot, unfortunately, that you can do for people. There's the medications, but they put a lot of people to sleep, which is great, and then the inner ear rebalances and passes. Uh, and they settle down into that motion. Um, but really, it's just something that unfortunately, you've got to ride it out. Um, drink um, lots of water, small regular sips, lay down flat, look at the horizon, keep nice and cool, take the medication and remind yourself that you're doing this to do something extraordinary. <laughs> <laughs> um, from a space perspective, uh, space flight sickness is what they call it, is uh, really common for, for astronauts when they go to space. Uh, and it's really unclear, much like uh, motion sickness, who will be affected and who won't be. Um, the uh, space agencies have slightly different policies. Uh, some give IM injections of medication before launch. Some give uh, uh, opportunity to access medications in flight if they need them. There's slight adjustments in uh, meal frequency and volume for the first few days in flight. But that's also accompanied with um, astronauts when they first get to flight, mostly become constipated as well. And it's not entirely clear how that works. So um, the first few days in flight aren't necessarily that glamorous. Um, but the, uh, the, the, the process is often around the sort of recalibration of um, working out where's up and where's down. If you speak to uh, most astronauts, they'll say the most uh, unnerving thing is either if they're doing a spacewalk outside the, uh, the space station and they suddenly lose their frame of reference, they can feel like they're falling even if they're just sitting still in, in, in space. They can also get the same effect within the space station as well, which is why if you ever see it on TV, you'll notice that there is a defined up and down you technically it can work in any uh, dimension that you want, but there's a defined ceiling and floor, uh, and that's to help with reducing that uh, space motion sickness when they get to orbit. I'm not going to be available. 
question. Incredible. All righty, I think down the front here and then we'll go out the yep. back. Oh, hello. Yeah. Hi, uh, Danielle Drees, uh, Akram Registrar and Guy Warren from South Australia. I have a question. Obviously, these are extreme, um, very um, highly attractive if you, you know, love the extreme sort of side of medicine. I'm wondering whether you guys have five, ten year plans and where you guys see yourself in that time, whether this is a longevity thing, where do you see succession planning, whether you're nurturing other people into that role, um, and whether you even think about it, or is it sort of be present in the moment, I'm loving what I'm doing? I think that's a really, really good and important question. I think, Alison, did you want to touch on that first? I see that remote Australian medicine will be always a part of my career in some shape and capacity. I, as I said earlier, over the last 18 months, have been the public health medical officer for the Torres and Cape, and so I'm partway through my second fellowship um, to become a public health physician and hope to provide public health services to the Torres and Cape. I suspect that five, ten years from now, I won't be living in a remote area, but that's because I have particular career goals that probably preclude me from living in a remote area. Nonetheless, I have built up a really strong relationship with the community, and I know that I can go back and hope to go back for shorter periods of time for the rest of my career. Dan, what about you? <laughs> um, yeah, I keep telling my wife I think time is coming. But um, uh, look, one of the things we build in at Rock and Ship is succession planning. So the work we do in any particular place can be succeeded and delivered autonomously in country by the particular nation that's engaging us. So we seek actively to do ourselves out of a job from the time we start. Um, me, I went to Tonga as a med student um, in fourth year. And it's great to be back in the Pacific. I rekindled this relationship in 2013. Um, I do it in short spurts because that works for me in family life and I suspect I'll do it while I'm still enjoying it. Mm. I've got a question for John and Kate. You were in this extreme medicine session, um, I, you know, either from what you've heard from other people or your own experience, do you want to share an extreme case with us? from space or Antarctica? Because, so, I mean, this is a fit group of people who've been pre-selected, they've been screened, you know, yeah. bad shit shouldn't happen. <laughs> yeah, it still does, <laughs> yeah. Um, what, one of the challenges with um, operating in a, a, an extreme environment, be it Antarctica or, or human spaceflight, is that the um, roles of the, the doctor uh, and the, the, the legislation that you work under still applies. So there's um, uh, patient confidentiality is essential, and that's why a lot of the research around space health in particular is, is quite challenging because there needs to be substantial de-identification for any publication, for example, uh, to ensure that the... Uh, you, you, is this a long way of saying you're not going to give us a... No, no, not case. at all, not at all. <laughs> but I think it's, it's a really important context because it's often a question that you get quite a lot. When I came back from Davis Station uh, earlier this year, one of the questions I got most often was, what's the best thing that happened medically? And you have to be really careful because you can't identify your patients. That said, within uh, the, the spaceflight arena, and I'll let Kate talk about the Antarctic side of things, within the spaceflight arena, there's well-published evidence of significant cardiac arrhythmias, um, SVT, rapid AF, there's uh, trauma, there's what's been likely an appendicitis for a, a Russian cosmonaut, um, who was returned to Earth in the 1980s. Um, there's been um, a, a, a deep vein thrombosis, or uh, including the jugular um, vein, um, that was diagnosed a couple of years ago on a routine ultrasound study as part of a scientific endeavour. Um, so things happen. And uh, even if you have the most screened, uh, intelligent, motivated, conservative group of people, people are still people. And medical events pop up and people still do silly things. So there's lots of things in the literature. And I assume the Mediterranean diet's a problem in space. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's more the dehydrated, rapid, uh, paced diet, I think, that can be a bit of a problem, yeah. Kate? 
yeah, look, look similar to John where we're dealing with very small numbers of, of people um, and it doesn't take much to connect the dots between a season and a station to know who that's going to be, um, particularly if it's a woman, given that um, about 80 to 90 percent of the station population is male. Um, but look, that said similarly to, to what John said, things still definitely happen and, and that's why we're down there as, as medical officers is one, to provide that ongoing preventative health to prevent those medical events from happening, but also to be there when unfortunately the inevitable does because you can, as we all know in our job, we can do the best preventative health to people and things still happen, people still get sick, that medical event still happens. Um, so we have a register called the Australian Antarctic Health Registry that um, has been recorded since 1947 with every medical event that's happened on every station. And when you go back and look at that, it's been about once a year that there's been a major medical event on every station, um, be that surgical or be that a, a medical emergency um, or an accident. Um, and what I can talk about, because it's published in Annabelle Braley's wonderful book, um, Bush Doctors, is on my very first season, um, six weeks into the job, I did an open appendectomy on one of my expeditioners who had also become one of my good friends. And that was, I think, the moment that it took me from while well, I intellectually understood where I was and what I was doing, it was the immediate reality that I am the doctor for these people, I am their medical help, and this is not just a wonderful Antarctic experience, this is real medical practice. Thank you, Kate. Uh, unfortunately to everyone, we've just run out of time. Um, if you do get a chance to catch our panelists after the session, please continue the conversations. But please uh, join us in thanking our incredible panelists that really um, represent the diversity of being a real journalist. Thank you. And uh, thanks to Tendai and Jazz for that too. It was re really well conducted. Um, that's the end of this plenary. Uh, morning teas in the exhibition hall. Don't forget the poster blitz in the foyer. Don't forget the Akram history, 25-year history timeline. Get your uh, Polaroid taken. After morning tea, eight concurrent sessions to choose from. And the final pre-lunch yoga session in the wellness center. I noticed that the male to female ratio has gone up, which is good. Lunch and learn in the exhibition hall. Presentation from Defence for Force Recruiting. And uh, I'll see you again at the plenary at one o'clock. Please thank again our great panelists.